Okay, so taming nature, a pet topic of domestication. So we're gonna be talking about two um, very related processes here. Um, domestication, which I'll define in just a moment, but basically I'm looking uh, today a little bit at livestock uh, and mostly looking at the, briefly at the early origins of livestock, but then also pets, the keeping of animals as pets. And um, in that case, I'm looking a little bit more at recent times. Um, and I'll we'll briefly define what, what a pet is as well. You know, we all know what it is, but, but what, what makes something a pet versus say livestock. Um, and again, it's interesting because we're the only species that does either of these things. And as I believe I said on the first day, you know, looking at what makes us human, um, a lot of people say that, that that is a human quality. The, we are the species that keeps other animals as pets. So looking at this today, uh, it also brings up some other topics as always. So first off, this is, of course, this is environmental history, but also biologists study this phenomena and sociologists study this phenomena. There are political implications. And there is actually a field and it's a relatively new field uh, called anthrozoology, which is the study of the relations between humans. And to be honest, it is mostly a psychology field. Um, in fact, the, the Dean of Arts and Sciences at, at, at ABAC, Dr. M Matthew Anderson, he's, a, he's an animal psychologist or psychologist that uses animals as his studies. And he considers himself also an anthrozoologist. But it is a, a relatively new field, but it involves psychology, but it also involves historians. It can involve um, animal behaviorists, uh, political scientists, anything that deals with the relationship between humans and animals. And the reason I bring it up is because as you're beginning your careers and you start writing things and you want to publish things and, and, and go to conferences and, you know, you, you, you may get tired of going to the same history conference or the same political science conference or, you know, this is just another one of those options to be thinking about. It's also another way to market yourself. I mean, you know, especially as you're going for jobs, like, what are you? And, you, you know, you can't just say historian. Well, what kind of historian are you? And so this is something else that if you do a lot of studies of animals and humans, you can say, well, I'm a historian, but I'm also an anthrozoologist. I don't consider myself an anthrozoologist, but some of my research does uh, tie in with this. And there, there are more than one, but this is the main sort of International Society for Anthrozoology. And by the way, that's something you guys need to be thinking about as you start to graduate. I know a couple of you, it's a while off, but as you start to graduate is joining societies. Um, you know, the, depending on what you're doing, a military historical society, Florida historical society I belong to, there's the Georgia historical society, Southern historical society. This is just another one of those. Um, you get journal, that's how, that, that's how you get the journals, but it's also what you put on your resume, your CV, as we call it. Um, and that's what helps get you jobs. So be thinking about that. And this is I, again, most of you wouldn't want to join this one unless you're specifically, and some of you are, into studying of animals and history of animals. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I, as I've mentioned before, I am working on a book on 1970s Florida. Of course, I'm recording this in the fall of 2021. So hopefully, if anybody's listening to this in 22 or 23, uh, the, the book is completed. But it's looking at Florida in the 70s, and a lot of it does deal with the environment. And one part of it um, I'm actually doing right now as a paper for a conference in, in February, and it's looking at these wild, well, feral, that means wild, uh, tame animals that are now back to the wild, but they're basically escaped monkeys that, that escaped from a small zoo around Silver Springs, Florida in the 20s. So for 90 years, they've lived in the woods around Silver Springs, and there, there's actually three colonies of them, and there's tons of debate on what to do with them, whether we eradicate them as an invasive exotic or use them as a tourist attraction, or hey, they've been there 90 years, leave them alone. Um, and it's a huge issue in Florida. And that, it, I'm looking at the history of that. I'm not looking at today, but, but the beginning of that debate all the way up until about the 90s. Um, but that's an, that's an example of anthrozoology. And I'm actually, if I can get done with it, I'm actually looking at trying to get it published at an anthrozoology journal. Anyway, just trying to show you how you can take some history stuff and market it in a slightly different way. The field itself, which some of the information from today's lecture does come from some of these scholars. Um, the field itself, uh, one of the founders of anthrozoology is Hal Herzog. 
um, and this is, he's written a lot of articles, but this is the, the, the sort of the public book that, you know, if you're going to read, it's actually a little bit of today's lecture came out of this. Um, James Serpell is another one of these founders of the field. He does a lot of work about the history of dogs um, and, and written quite a bit about that. This is his kind of his big book on that. Uh, Carl Safina is another one. And I, I put this up. It's a good book. I have it. But the reason I put this up, it's not history again. Um, but it's, it's that title, Beyond Words, What Animals Think and Feel. Um, and of course, this is something that in environmental history, but also in psychology, in biology, uh, there's a lot of debate, you know, and we briefly talked about that with uh, apes and communicating. Can, can they communicate with us beyond super basic ideas? I mean, can they have you know, I could understand human thought. There's a very famous essay. Uh, again, it's not technically an environmental history essay, but it, it is used a lot in environmental history. Um, and that is what it's like to be a bat. And this is a relatively short essay written by a, a person named Thomas Nagel, a philosopher. And, and again, it's, it was highly controversial, still controversial. But Nagel's basic argument is that we can never know. We can't really know cross species, what another species is really thinking, what it's like to be another animal. Um, and, and again, that seems silly. You know, you think, well, of course not. But, but then again, if you think about a lot of our behavior, you know, when we talk about dogs or cats or cows or whether we should have pets or not, whether we should be hunting or not, whether we should eat meat or not, it gets a lot into this. Uh, well, animals feel this or animals feel that and we shouldn't do this. And, and again, he does argue, and, and as does anybody else that studies animal behavior, that, that obviously you can tell when an animal is in pain, especially a dog. Um, and, and there are differences between how like a dog communicates, which, as we'll see later, communicates very well with humans, and then other animals that don't communicate at all, like a bat. I mean, I, I don't think you can just look at a bat and know whether it's happy or sad. But you can look at a dog and know that. Um, so, so sometimes we can get basic signals, but even then, even with a dog, we don't really know what it's thinking, what it's like to be a dog. And, and again, it's just something to kind of keep in mind when we're studying in nature is that even though we're part of nature, we, we are separate from it. We, we, we are different from other nature. And we have to just acknowledge that a lot of this is, it, it's a gulf between us and that. It's a chasm that we're never going to probably be able to cross. Uh, we can try, but we're probably never going to cross. And that, and that, that plays a role when we're describing animals and their behavior. Um, sometimes we may not be able to really describe what they're doing. So this is a very famous essay, uh, what it's like to be a bat. We can't seem to get away from uh, Bill Cronin, can we? Uh, but uh, it is important, um, some of his ideas, because again, he is one of the major founders of this field. And so his ideas kind of become you know, the accepted ideas. Uh, I've mentioned this book before. This is considered Cronin's uh, magnum opus, his big project, Nature's Metropolis. And for those ABAC students who will be taking uh, Dr. Pryor's Food Factory and Farms class, this is one of the main textbooks for it. It is a very important book. It's a huge book, uh, but, but, and it does deal some with livestock. I mean, it deals with some, uh, uh, capitalist, capitalism and farming. Uh, and he does talk quite a bit about cows in it, but um, the only use I'm using for this book today is, is a concept I've kind of talked about without using the terms. And it's a concept that will continue to play a role in our class. Very simple concept um, that I think people instinctively know uh, but Cronin kind of coined the phrases. So that's first and second nature. So first nature uh, is basically nature that is unaffected by human behavior or human actions, you know, just truly nature, um, a virgin forest, uh, deep sea oceans or something like that. And even that's starting to be debated, but anyway. Um, and then second nature represents that part of nature that has been affected in a big way uh, by human behavior, whether it's through pollution or usually it deals more with the altering of nature. Um, and again, sometimes you think that would be very obvious. The first nature would be uh, the Brazilian rainforest. Second nature would be New York City. You know, that's obviously, because uh, we are part of nature. 
Um, so, you know, the house I'm sitting in right now is would be second nature. I mean, it is still nature because humans created it. It's made out of nature. But it's, we wouldn't call this first nature because it's a house or it's a car or it's a computer. But it can get very subtle sometimes, the difference between first nature and second nature. And this gets into that question I've asked a couple of times. Well, what is natural? We talk about something being natural. What does that mean? And what we really mean is we really mean first nature. When we say something is natural, that's really what we're saying. We're saying it's first nature. Because again, you and I are nature, um, but, but most of what we do, we we don't consider it to be natural. And what it really is is second nature. So let me give you a couple of examples because of second nature versus first nature. So obviously New York City, uh, everybody would recognize that as second nature, right? Um, but Central Park, uh, and again, if you've ever been in New York, it's huge. Um, and there are parts of it that you really feel like you're in the middle of the woods. And yet the entire park was created in the late 1800s. None of this existed. I mean, the trees were planted, the grass was planted, the lakes were created. It is a completely human constructed facility, um, but yet it looks totally natural. You know, so a lot of people may not think of that as uh, second nature, but it's exactly what it is. Um, a lot of other natural landscapes or, or it seems to be natural. I mean, obviously this is man very much manicured, but a lot of city parks and state parks, um, you know, are green spaces, uh, which, uh, you know, made up of plants, but they are, of course, second nature. And, and, and so many humans, especially in the modern world and, and, and the Western world, their interaction with nature is almost never first nature. Uh, you know, down in the South where we are, we have a lot of woods around, although some of those are second nature, but still, we, you know, people hunt, people fish more, they walk in the woods. But if you live up North or, or even Atlanta or something, so much of your interaction with the natural world will be second nature, not first nature. Um, again, think about a front yard or a backyard. I mean, even if it's kind of wild looking, that is second nature, if you will. Uh, this is longleaf pine forest, sort of considered the, the one of the major ecosystems in the Southeast. And, and much of the Southeast was, of course, longleaf pine forest, which again, you have these longleaf pines um, and then kind of a, 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 uh, an open understory um, with, with things like palmettos growing and animals like gopher tortoises and Sherman's fox squirrels. Um, and of course, it's an it's a ecosystem partly maintained by fire. But of course, uh, and these animals and, and plants are adapted to fire, and fire could be started by lightning. But also, we know we do fire. You know, we do control control burnings and prescribed burnings. Even at ABAC, we do that. Uh, but also, Native Americans did it, going all the way back 10, 12, 13,000 years. Um, so, is it first nature or second nature? It, it might depend. Um, if it's human, even, even going back to Native Americans, if humans are, are the ones starting the fire to promote deer and growth, um, then that's second nature. Also, if you're in a, like a state park, like I used to work for, they used to restore ecosystems back to, say, a longleaf pine forest. And they would plant the pines, they would do prescribed burning. So again, it may look natural, but then in that case, it would be second nature. This is the Highlands in Scotland. Beautiful. Uh, they are truly breathtaking when you go see them, but this really is what they look like. Um, and it looks, you think, oh, of course, that's first nature. But then you walk around and you can see evidence of, of, of buildings. You can just barely make out evidence of stone buildings. And then you realize, um, and we know this through historic records and, and through uh, other means, that these mountains, in many cases, were covered in trees at one time. But it was through human fire, human deforestation, changing uh, e the ecosystem. Um, actually, in the introduction of livestock, like sheep, also played a huge role in this. So humans were cutting down a lot of the trees, but as younger trees were, were springing up, the, the, the sheep that were being brought in uh, were grazing and they were eating all the shoots. So this is both a human created, but also livestock coming in and, and completely altering the highlands. And so everybody seems this is natural, but in a way it is second nature. The, the Shenandoah Valley and the Blue Ridge Mountains, or in this case, the Smoky Mountains. Again, you look at them, you think, oh, they're beautiful and they're totally natural. Mm, not completely. Because um, again, in the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Smoky Mountains, um, most of these mountains didn't have trees uh, by the 20th century. They had people living on these mountains, they were farming these mountains, they, they'd been logged out. Uh, the federal government uh, came in, bought much of this land, moved the people off the land, and then planted all these trees and created these vistas. Uh, so it's really, in many ways, a large garden, more so than it is truly nature. So that would be second nature.
Uh, and of course, we know dogs, which we're going to talk a little bit about today, or, you know, they don't exist in the wild. In fact, they, they can't survive in the wild. They are fully domesticated species, and they are second nature. Even though they come from first nature, gray wolves, they are second nature. Uh, even at ABAC, you walk around and you see the greens, terrible photo, <laughs> but you see the greens and even the woods around. But of course, all that green space, most of that's been planted and maintained and manicured. So even though it's good green spaces, it is second nature. And there's nothing wrong, by the way. Sometimes I, I know when we have these conversations in class, even about agriculture, sometimes it, you know, it, it, I think the impression is it, it, it's something, this is good and this is bad. And that's something as historians, we have to be careful of. Uh, we, we don't always want everything to be this is good and this is bad, or this is right, this is wrong. Um, most of the time we're just describing things. In this case, it's just, it's just a recognition that not everything is first nature. A lot of things is second nature. Um, and of course, again, even though we're not going to get much into plants today, um, you know, when we talk about crops, uh, we are talking to, by the time that you and I get to these crops, in other words, after thousands of years, these things are truly um, second nature, very much second nature. In fact, you could argue corn is a, a, a human cultural artifact much more than it is a natural thing and something else that also does not survive in nature. So a lot of these new breeds of animals and plants, of course, are coming out of uh, what we might call the agricultural revolution. We talked about agriculture already. Uh, we, I don't think I use that phrase, but that's basically what we're describing. It changes the way humans behave. Um, as we talked about, there's a lot of lots of benefits to it, especially today. But in the early days, not so much you and I, but but in the early days, there was a huge price that we paid uh, for farming as far as the, the amount of labor put into it uh, for a short for, for a while. We actually had shorter lives, more violence, more famine, more diseases. But in the long run, it, uh, we had huge benefits uh, from doing this. Uh, and that also includes new, new plants and animals as well. Um, and but one of the things we did talk about, one of the prices we pay, we still pay this price, uh, but but we fix it a little bit with with trade. But even today, if you look at most of what we eat uh, and most people in the world, what they eat really comes from a relatively small amount of plants. I mean, there's thousands of varieties of plants, but most of what we eat is from about 12 plants. And in fact, most of it's from about four plants, you know, things like wheat and corn and rice and potatoes and sugar. Um, and same with animals. We eat a lot of meat. In fact, we humans eat more meat today than we've ever eaten. You know, there really wasn't a paleo diet where you know, cavemen just ate meat. They mostly ate plants. Uh, that, that's the idea of eating a lot of meat is a modern concept. But even at that, despite all the all the different kinds of animals, um, essentially it's really a, about or five. In fact, I would really say four. They have buffalo here, but most of us don't eat buff bison. That, that's really other parts of the world. But that's really most of our meat is really from just a relatively few amount of animals. And of course, all these animals today are second nature um, because they've all been genetically modified uh, it was through breeding and such. Um, again, there's a lot of concern about GMOs. Uh, genetically modified organis organisms. And some of this is a little bit of the naturalistic fallacy. If it's not natural, it must be bad. Uh, although there are some genuine concerns, um, but, but some of the fears over genetically modified crops um, don't seem to have a lot of strong uh, basis in science. I mean, it really, you really do have to take it case by case. Uh, and again, what here, this one, this is just various uh, images I found online, warning about GMOs. This one refers to them as Franken food, you know, as in Frankenstein, they're monsters, they're not natural. Um, and there are some aspects of some of these that have been bred um, and, and, and uh, created to do kind of again resist certain things, resist pests and things like that, uh, which we actually, a lot of this, we completely benefit from. I mean, you know, we couldn't live our modern life without some of this. Um, but, but there may be some concerns, but you do have to kind of take it case by case. But uh, sort of my point today is that almost all of these crops, whether they're GMOs or not, they're all second nature. And in many ways, corn, maize, uh, which comes from the Teosinti weed. It's, it's a GMO going back thousands of years. It's been a GMO ever since. Uh, Native Americans in Central America uh, actually began to create corn out of the Teosinti weed. And so again, all this natural food is really, people see, I eat fully natural. You're like, oh, actually you eat fully second natural. You're not eating first natural most of the time. Seafood might be, you, you could argue seafood is first nature because it does come out of the wild. Venison comes out of the wild. Uh, but most of the food we eat 
comes from second nature. Uh, and of course, we, we talk a lot about plants, you know, crops, uh, but many people, a lot of you are farmers or come from farmers, so you think about this, but most people don't think about animals as being part of farming. But of course, they are also another type of crop, if you will. And so again, our farm animals today um, are, are second nature. You know, they come from first nature, but they are second nature. So let's talk a little bit about domestication and let's talk uh, again, let, let's define some things first. So domestication, I mean, I think we all know what it means, but technically it's the conversion of wild animals, first nature, into those that live within human society. In other words, another way to say it, it's conversion of first nature into second nature. And this could be as pets, this could be as lab animals, this could be as livestock. And those are the two things I'm talking about, pets and livestock, but also circus performers, zoos, you know, actually keeping pets. I mean, basically they're pets, uh, keeping animals in zoos. Uh, zoos are another example of second nature that pretends to be first nature. And we'll talk about zoos much later. There's a couple of ways that you can domesticate. Um, they're self-taming. And in fact, a lot of animals do seem to self-tame. Um, cats seem to be one that have more self-tamed than us taming them. And even dogs, even though we, we partly tame dogs, but, but more likely it started with them coming to us, getting food, wanting to be around us, and then us then taking control of it. But we can also direct it. In many cases, we do direct it. And we do that through capturing, you know, like, like if you got a, a, a say a, a group of dogs in the wild or wolves, you may take the one that's tame. You may not take the wild one that's about to bite you. You take the tame one, the one that looks like it wants to be around you. And then you, and then you breed that one with other ones that are similar. And over time, you create different breeds of, the, of dogs. Um, so that's really you know, selective capturing and breeding, promoting things that you want and trying to weed out the stuff that you don't want. So that's basically domestication. And all human cultures, to some degree, have done domestication, although not all cultures do pets and definitely not all cultures have had livestock. And of course, like everything else in human history, and this is again, one of the values of doing environmental history is that nature both gives us the possibilities of what we can do, but it also sets up the limits of what we can do. And there's always the uncomfortable question as a historian, especially when I teach you know, first year college students um, and, you're, you know, and you're talking about uh, you know, how we're all equal and, and, and human, all human cultures do have value and we should look at them, uh, you know, and, and people believe that, but, but there's always that uncomfortable question. Sometimes it's said out loud, sometimes I can see them thinking it, and that is, you know, looking around the world both today and in the past and going, well, why are certain parts of the world very poor? It looks today like Africa is very poor, parts of Latin America, very poor, parts of Southeast Asia, very poor. Uh, they don't seem to have the same development other places do. You look at Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, much more development. And of course, years ago, there was very racist arguments for why that is the case. Um, I also argue as a story, you have, to, you have to think about when are we talking about? Uh, there's, you know, 500 years ago, Europe was not the most developed place in the world. Actually, parts of Western Africa and parts of Central America were the most developed parts of the world. So a lot of this has to do with time, you know, when we're talking about, you know, because life is not teleological as we know. It, 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 there is no goal to life, in other words. Um, but a lot of it also has to do with things like climate, available resources, right? You know, if you happen to have a lot of oil or gold or diamonds or, or, or good soil to grow on, like the United States, of course you're going to be rich. And if you're a country like Belize, a wonderful little country in Central America, but doesn't have many natural resources, you're going to be poor. Uh, but livestock, domesticating animals has, uh, it turns out, just like cooking, just like farming in general, the, the ability to domesticate animals has huge implications historically. And um, it, you first, however, have to have animals that you can domesticate. Not all animals can be domesticated. Um, to some degree, what we're doing as humans is, is we're hijacking um, the, the existing social behavior of, of animals. And if animals are hierarchical, take dogs, you, you know, you have a pack of dogs, there's always going to be an alpha dog, a dog sort of in charge. Chimps are this way, there's going to be one in charge. Gorillas are that way. Um, cows are that way, you're going to have a lead steer, you know, and, and, and that's why if you become that animal, you can, what you do, the animals will all copy you. I mean, anybody who owns a dog knows that after a while, they begin to look at you as the alpha dog. And, you know, you say sit, they sit, you know. Um, not all animals have that, though. 
Like that's why it's quite remarkable that we have cats as pets because cats are completely not hierarchical now, but, but that's for later. So let's look at a couple of places in the world. Let's look uh, briefly at, for instance, Africa, uh, the continent of Africa. I'm more interested in Western Africa because that's the part of Africa that has the most impact on the United States, most African-Americans today. Uh, this is where they would come from. Obviously so much of our culture today that comes from Africa comes from this part of, of Western Africa, which is a huge area. It's the size of the United States. Um, and cultures have been there going all the way back you know, to the beginning of humans. And we see some of the very first cooking here. We see some of the very first pottery here. A lot of the very first metal tools are here and very early farming. Um, but, and by the time of, uh, by the time that Europeans arrived in the 1400s, these are massive empires. In fact, we think the, the richest person to have ever lived, Mansa Musa, lived in Western Africa. But yet they also had a limitations. And one of those limitations is they don't really have any animals, at least originally, that were good for domesticating, except one, the guinea fowl, um, which is it's essentially a chicken, if you will. Um, you can get eggs from it, you can eat it, you get feathers from it to do things with, but you're kind of, let me think about all the things we use animals for, uh, building castles, uh, you know, building pyramids, carrying things, you can ride on it, you can't do any of that with a chicken, essentially. Eventually, Western Africa does get camels and does get cattle coming across the Sahara Desert from what is today the Middle East, but that's pretty late in the game. And so, you know, that which means cultures that did have camels or cows or horses have a lot of advantages in their development that, again, a place like Western Africa didn't have. So this is, it's not the only reason, but this is sometimes why history plays out the way it does. Another area is the Americas, which is mostly what we're talking about in our class. And we've already, we just got done talking about um, Native Americans. So... And again, we, we, we know that there are all kinds of cultures here. You have Aztecs and Mayans and Incas, which were highly developed, lived in cities with huge buildings. But at the same time, um, Native Americans, because they were cut off from the rest of the world after the Ice Age, had a lot of limitations. And one of the things that they did not have was domesticated animals. They did have dogs, although not massive numbers, and dogs coming from the old world with humans. So there, there were dogs, although in some cases they were Aztecs farm dogs to eat. Um, but in other cases, people use them with hunting. But beyond the dog, which again, were not overly plentiful, in North America, there were absolutely no animals domesticated. And that's, as we're gonna see in a moment, that is a huge disadvantage. Uh, in South America, at least part of South America, around the Andes Mountains, basically think Peru, um, that's the area of the Incas, they had, um, one of the, a, a basically kind of a cousin to the camel, and that is the llama and the very closely related alpaca. Uh, these animals were indeed domesticated, um, and it was an advantage for the people who domesticated them. They could they could they could ride, they could carry things. Again, as you can see from this photo, they're they're not as large as other domesticated animals in other parts of the world, but but it did provide some um, advantages. But again it is uh, somewhat limited. Um, and so you look at a place like Europe, a uh, very small area, but yet they, they had access to a lot of domesticated animals. And we'll see this in other parts of Africa, we'll see this in Asia, and that's gonna be a huge advantage to those peoples. So there are truly livestock, historically speaking, again, uh, as I'm always saying, this is not necessarily about today, this was about thousands of years ago, all the way up to hundreds of years ago. So what are some of the advantages of having livestock? So livestock basically is sort of canned hunting. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Instead of going out in the woods and having to find the animal, and maybe you don't find them. Um, and again, you try to, you know, especially pre-guns, you, you try to kill an animal. I mean, even today, you try to kill a grizzly. You, you know, you don't get it right. It's going to come after you and maybe attack you. It can be highly dangerous. It could be unpredictable. Um, so by taking animals you want to eat and, you know, and, and beginning to domesticate them, you can either keep them in a field and just go out and take them when you need them, you know where they are, or you can fence off a, per, a area like for chickens or pigs, and suddenly you got a steady supply of meat. Um, so cows, for instance, have been bred over time uh, to be much tamer than their original 
um, natural counterparts, which are now extinct. Um, and so if we say just keeping a cow, um, you have a steady supply of meat, you have a, a fur of hides of, uh, you know, again, we talked about bison, all the things you could get from a bison, you could do that also with horses and cows as well. Um, you know, all kinds of products were made for, from the byproducts of these animals. But I have the word tallow up here. Um, this is, uh, again, showing evidence of people, in fact, I, I, know, I think, yeah, I think that's a cow. It could be a deer, but I think that's supposed to be a cow. Um, but, but, you know, trade, I mean, this creates a whole market for jobs and such. People that used to be called fleshers, today we would call them butchers, uh, people who sell flesh, who, who cut flesh and sell it uh, for eating. But tallow is basically the fat, and uh, candles were made from this. Um, so that was a huge boon for anybody who accessed all this tallow, because now you have candles that keep light at night. Apparently, by the way, uh, you know, this is pre-wax, obviously. Bees, by the way, I, I, I did not get into that day, but kind of a domesticated animal, kind of a livestock. You, know, you keep beehives, you can get honey and wax from them. But the one thing to kind of keep in mind when, when you're thinking about the past and the burning candles is that apparently these really, really stunk. It was just basically burning fat. Uh, but apparently they were really amazing candles. At the same. So in addition to sort of meat, another thing that you, you see is milk, of course, and not from all animals, uh, but 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 from certain ones at least, definitely goats, definitely cows. So you have the milk itself. In a few moments, I'll talk about the advantages of milk, uh, but also things like cheese, yogurt, cream, and other dairy products that you can get. Um, and again, you couldn't do this just to any animal. Um, you have to have an animal that's tamed to begin with and one that you've tamed, and then you've bred it more to lactate all them. And it is such a weird thing that we do, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, labor. Um, livestock provides labor for us in all kinds of ways. Even today, we still use livestock for labor. We still use the term horsepower to describe a car or a boat, for instance. Think about all the advantages of farming. I mean, these are the original tractors, if you will. This is the original mechanized farming using uh, the horse or ox and plow, if you will. Um, and so, but also carrying things. I mean, I like this image because um, it shows people riding on a horse, but they're also helping to till the field. Um, but you look behind, you see this massive structure, this castle, and, and absolutely, probably oxen and, and, and mules and horses were used to transport materials there to help lift things, uh, help power things. So again, you, going back to Africa, you couldn't do the, any of that with a chicken, right? Obviously, the more, you know, Transportation, that's probably the most obvious thing that people think, especially when you think about horses, but also elephants, also llamas, also camels. Uh, you, you can ride around on these things and for long distances, if you will. Um, so that, that expands um, the territory that we can live in in a relatively, you know, I mean, um, you know, being able to go from here to here in a relatively short amount of time, it speeds up the pace of life, if you will. And of course, you know, you have to feed these animals. That's one of the prices we pay. Um, but and, and but you also you're recycling the food. You know, you eat the food, you feed the scraps to the animals. They eat it. <laughs> they they excrete it out. We take that fertile that midnight soil and we put it back in the fields and we keep growing. Even today, people buy cow manure at the store for their for their gardens and such. Uh, so this was a huge uh, boon. You know, because this is you know think about Native Americans in North America that didn't have. Uh, livestock to get fertilizer to actually grow the crops with. Um, by the way, all peoples up to about 100 years ago, maybe actually now about 150 years ago, would have also used human feces, what we call midnight soil. Um, and we'll talk about that when we talk about sewage. Um, so that's what Native Americans would have had to have used because they didn't have any livestock with which to get this. And of course, fertilize, uh, it can be fertilized, but it's also a fuel. I mean, you can burn cow patties, for instance, the people did actually do that. Um, so a lot of what we consider to be Western life, as well as Chinese life, as well as parts of Africa, is would have been impossible without uh, animals. And this also is why Native America looks very different uh, from Europeans. Um, and warmth, this is the last one. And this might seem like a weird one, but some of you may have heard the term three dog night. That means when it's really cold, you put three dogs in your bed and warm you up. Um, in Europe, for instance, people used to live with especially poor people, peasant farmers, you lived with your animals. You know, so your cows and, and, and your horses and your dogs and sheep would be in the house with you. So you could protect them. I mean, you probably couldn't afford to have a barn, um, but also they kept you warm. 
And in fact, in many houses, uh, this, you know, they, they would literally had in the middle of the room, just a big thing of hay and humans would have laid on it as well as the animals. Um, so our images sometimes of medieval life, <laughs> we forget to add the animals to those sometimes. So let's talk about some of these specific uh, animals of livestock briefly and look at where they come from. Of course, I think the, the quintessential farm animal, um, every little kid knows that the cow goes moo, right? <laughs> you know, so let's talk a little bit about cows. Um, the cattle today is second nature. You know, cattle today does not exist in the wild. Uh, what we have as cattle today comes from an earlier animal um, called the auric. Um, which was basically the wild version of cows, much larger, uh, less tame, a um, little more tougher meat. Um, again, a truly wild animal, uh, huge, by the way. And unfortunately, they're not around anymore, but we do have fossils of them. We also have some descendants today that, that are similar, especially in parts of Asia. Um, but as far as we can tell, the Oryx uh, developed about 2 million years ago, initially in India and other parts of Asia, and then would have naturally migrated to Africa and, and uh, uh, Middle East and then Africa. Um, so, so this is the area where people were going to first obviously domesticate these. Europe eventually gives them about 300,000 years ago. They're never quite as, as, as plentiful there as we'll see in other parts of the world. Uh, but also, ironically, the, uh, Europe was... You know, they were the last ones to get up. They were also the last ones to, to get rid of them in that um, the last one that we know of that ever existed was in 1627 in Poland. But humans uh, throughout the world, at least the old world, um, bred these and tamed these from the original Oryx to over 700 breeds of cattle. Um, and these, many of these breeds still exist, but unfortunately, it's, it's kind of part, one of the byproducts of modern industrial farming is uh, there is a real desire by beef producers to have kind of a uniform type of beef um, because, you know, you don't want to go to McDonald's, eat a burger, and it tastes one way, and then a week later have another one and it tastes different. You want all of it. And Nature's Metropolis by William Cronin gets a little bit into this, um, the conversion of animals into a commodity. And even up to you know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, there were a lot more varieties raised on farms that those numbers are going down. It, it, it really has been dominated by just a few breeds. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's an interesting, so it starts with one, goes to many, and now is kind of going back to, to a few again. So having cows, obviously you, you can get meat from them, you can get labor from them, uh, but uniquely, at least in uh, our culture, this is, uh, you know, some little bit with goats, but this is mainly the animal that from which we get uh, milk from. And of course, there's a lot of advantages to milk. It is a weird thing that that we humans drink the lactation juices. I'm trying to make it sound gross. Lactation juices of another animal, and not only that, but the fact that we do it as adults, not as little babies, um, is very odd. But yet, I, I think very few people would want to drink breast milk. I mean, that just that just seems disgusting. I don't want to, you know, drink breast milk cheese. Gross. Uh, but yet, we, we don't think twice about doing it from a cow. I mean, it's just very odd if you think about it. Uh, and in fact, a lot of people, maybe some of you, are lactose intolerant. You can't really drink milk; it, it upsets your stomach, or worse. Uh, and people are like, "Oh, what's wrong with you? You got something. You got something wrong with you." Actually, it's everybody else that is odd because it is a mutation um, that we can tolerate milk outside of childhood. And so that is kind of weird, but it is an, a, a helpful adaptation, which is why we still have it, because by drinking milk beyond outside of just being a baby is that it, you provide more vitamin D, which you need, you provide calcium. It is a water source. It is primarily water. Um, so you may not have access to clean water, huge problem uh, in the past. Um, but also maybe during a time of drought, you still got the cow, you can still uh, milk the cow and drink the milk and get your water. In fact, uh, in medieval Europe, many people did not drink water. They drank beer and whiskey, which is another way to preserve water, and they drank milk. Um, so this was, this was one of the main water sources for a lot of people. So of course, uh, it, it is a food, it has calories, it, it has energy. Um, and of course, you can convert milk for preservation purposes, you can convert milk into other products like uh, various cheeses and, and, and yogurt and whey and things like that that can extend the shelf life of, of milk, if you will. 
And again, we still use a lot of dairy products today, but in most of these products go back hundreds, if not even a thousand years or more. Uh, by the way, going back to some of the weird research I've done looking at 1970s Florida, that was when people started caring about manatees and let's preserve the manatees. Um, but oddly enough, because they are sometimes called sea cows in the early 20th century in Florida, a lot of places would basically capture manatees and keep them captive uh, and they would milk the manatees. And I was trying to find a photo, I couldn't find my photo of, of, a, of a woman literally milking a manatee. Uh, and some people really thought, well, we can really do this, but mostly it was kind of a play on the word uh, sea cow. Uh, so anyway, that's just a, a, you probably never thought about milk and manatees going together and you probably never will again. <laughs> but talking about, say, dairy products, this is part of something that sometimes is called the secondary products revolution. You know, you have livestock, but then you can convert those livestock into other products. Um, and, and that's huge. And again, it's a huge advantage to having livestock. Now, of course, Native Americans could do this with deer and bison. We've talked about that. Uh, but there's a lot of work involved before you even get to that point. Here, it's much easier to be able to have these uh, various byproducts, if you will. So there's cows. Um, and again, the number of cows today uh, the biomass of cows is, is really quite unbelievable, and, and it's way beyond sort of the normal, natural uh, carrying capacity of, of cows. Another animal that's not quite as plentiful, but, but it can be as useful is camels. Um, what's interesting about camels, we usually associate them with the Middle East, but actually the origins of camels going uh, maybe 20 million years ago is actually North America. This is where the original camels were. They were at least uh, the, the, the several varieties, I don't have the exact number, sorry, but there's several varieties that were here. Uh, eventually these camels migrated uh, to, first they migrated southward uh, into uh, South America, because eventually these two continents would be united uh, at, with the Panama uh, isthmus, if you will. And so that allowed animals from North America to travel into South America. Uh, this is long before humans were around. And, and there they eventually turned, you know, evolved into llamas and alpacas. Uh, and then other camels or ancestors of the camels went over the Bering Land Bridge the other direction about 3 million years ago. Um, again, before humans were doing this and went over to the old world and then began to uh, evolve there. Eventually the ones in North America died out to some degree, probably through human hunting. Um, so now the camels are only found in the old world, even though they are a new world, if you will, uh, animal. Uh, about 3000 years ago in the Middle East is where we first start seeing the um, domestication of camels and they can be used for carrying things long distances, especially in hostile terrains. Uh, they're, they're humped and there's two different types of camels, one humped versus two humped. Um, but they, it's not a water tank full of water. Right? People sometimes have that thought, but it's not that. But nonetheless, they can actually uh, travel long distances. They can carry up to 600 pounds. That obviously can include people. Um, they can, basically this is the beginning of globalization in a big way because yes, people can move back and forth um, but you couldn't carry much. Um, now you could carry a lot. Uh, and you could have a whole, you know, a, a fleet of, you know, 500 camels. And imagine all the stuff you can carry with 500 camels going across the desert. So the main, you know, long distance trade is beginning to open up here. And of course, that trade eventually leads to the discovery of America. So in a way, camels partly led to the <laughs> discovery of the Americas. Uh, they can also be used for military, and they are still in some places, mo mostly for ceremonial purposes today. Uh, but they are large animals, and there is an intimidation factor there. Uh, Napoleon knew to, to use camels, and, and it did. In fact, even the U.S. Army in the 20th century uh, tried to develop, I think even Fort Benning in Georgia, they brought camels in uh, and tried to develop a, a camel brigade. Eventually, they, they, they abandoned that. Uh, this image here, by the way, is in Australia. All the camels were brought into Australia uh, because the, the thought was that they'll adapt well to this, and the locals, you know, we're talking 1800s, you can use it. And, and it became a big thing to ride around on your camel. Um, it was kind of another horse for them. And even today, there are feral, meaning used to, used to be tame, now they're wild, there are feral camels in Australia. But of course, when we think about riding around in animals and military use, um, the primary animal we think about is the horse. And here is Napoleon on his horse. And in fact, it became a, a symbol of power, a symbol of nobility. Uh, the, again, riding around on your horse and, and um, 
and the importance of horses is partly what led, at least in the Western world, to the taboo of eating horse meat. Most of you would be like, oh, I'm never going to eat horse meat because it, they were so important for purposes other than food that it eventually became a taboo uh, to eat a horse. Uh, horses it go all the way back to Asia. Um, and then eventually they, they do make their way to, some of them make their way to North America, again, over the Bering Land Bridge at the various times that that was opened up. Um, during the Pleistocene era, during the Ice Age, when humans by this point were around, there was at least 50 different varieties of horses and horse ancestors. Uh, of course, once humans show up, uh, as we know through the uh, uh, Paul Martin idea of overkill, uh, they're, they, they are gone. So no more wild horses in North America. There are a few today in places like at Cumberland Island, but those were brought in um, it, actually in the 20th century, in fact. And of course, you know, we've talked about, you know, the impact of horses on Native Americans and how they changed their lifestyle. But what's interesting is that, to, again, we tend to think of horses as basically an early car or early motorcycle, right? Um, and, and, it, and don't discount that because, oh my gosh, can you, how fast a horse can go. I mean, again, for short distances, it's as fast as a car. And you know, humans were able to do that, you know. But what's interesting is that most of the interaction between humans and horses for most of our existence, uh, and, and also for Neanderthals, it was as a source of protein, both scavenging dead horses, but, but hunting horses. Um, so, so for years and years and years, we ate horses, and then only later did we domesticate them and start using them uh, for travel and other things. So about 5,000 years ago, uh, in what's known as the Eurasian steppes, basically uh, Western, Eastern Europe and Western Asia, and places like Turkey, for instance, is where we start seeing the first uh, real domestication of horses. China is picking this up about 4,000 years ago. Uh, by 2,000 years ago, it's, they're being used directly in military activities and such. Um, and then, we, it, 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 then we, we still have them today. Many of you may have horses. Then we get to another farm animal uh, that to some degree has a little more limited use, but it's still hugely important. That, of course, is the pig. Um, they originate in Asia. The first signs of domestication, we know this through archaeology, um, is in China about 11,000 years ago. Now, even though pig products can be used in lots of things, pigs are a little more limited to a food source than, say, a cow or a horse or a camel. You're not riding around on pigs. You're not, um, you know, uh, carrying things usually with pigs, although they are really good for basically taking care of garbage. Later, we'll talk about the, how in the 20th century we started dealing with garbage and many communities including Tallahassee, Florida. I don't know about Tifton, but I know some of the other towns in Georgia, part of their the garbage um, sanitation department would be pigs. That They would have literally big, large pens of pigs. And so when you put your garbage out by the road, the garbage person would come and take it. And often they would dump it into these big pig pens and the pigs then would eat most of the garbage. And then of course, you're converting gar uh, garbage literally into food. Then, you know, then, then we're eating these pigs and we're basically eating our garbage. Uh, they have quit doing that for disease purposes, but all the way up till the 70s, some areas were using pigs uh, for, for garbage purposes. Um, but again, mostly we think about them for food, but again, some of the byproducts of pigs are also used in a lot of other uh, industrial products today. And you can pause it if you want to try to read all of these. Uh, what's interesting about pigs is, is that unlike some of the other animals, we do still see wild versions of pigs in the world today, including in North America. But the ones today are second nature, of course. They're feral pigs. They're, they're, they are pigs that were tame, brought over by Europeans, and either escaped or were purposely seeded into the woods. The Spanish had a policy of doing this. Uh, they would carry pigs with them as they were exploring. And when they went to an island or, or a new land, they would drop off several pigs, making sure male and female, because they knew uh, they'd come back a few years and there would be a whole lot of pigs. And so there was a steady supply of food source. Anybody that has owns any land or like in my case, working out of a, for a park, uh, fer feral pigs are a massive problem because they can completely upend an ecosystem and be very, very destructive. Um, so I've used this term a couple of times just to make sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. Feral just basically means it's kind of the, the flip side of domestication. It, it's going from domesticated animal back into the wild. And that's what we refer to as feral animals. Um, 
And, and, and one example of this, I mean, a lot of times we talk about feral cats and stuff, but, but sometimes, you know, this long enough, they will truly go back to being wild. The dingo, uh, D-I-N-G-O, which is a, basically you know, it's a dog in Australia. Uh, dogs come from wolves. Uh, as humans first migrated to Australia, who became the Australian Aborigines, they brought dogs with them. But for some reason, Australian Aborigines kind of just kind of let go of their dogs and the dogs went feral. And now they are wild animals known as dingoes. Um, but what's interesting, if you look at the pig, you know, if you look at wild pigs versus farm pigs, you see lots and lots of changes. Shorter snouts, curly tails, shorter legs, sloppy ears, smaller tusks, smaller brain, but not a less intelligent brain. In fact, pigs are very intelligent, just literally the size of the brain is smaller. Decreased sexual dimorphism. Remember, that's the difference between, say, males and females or females and males. Here, they're, they're much, because they're not having to really compete. Uh, they're, 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 it's easy breeding. They don't have to fight each other for food because they're getting fed. So that that what happens in the wild is beginning to go away. And even more diverse colors. They don't have to worry about predators seeing them because they're protected. Uh, you know, so so animals that were born with bright colors or lots of spots might have been immediately eaten by predators. Here they're not. So those traits are able to be passed on. Um, and a lot of aspects of domestication, because again, we're selecting animals that are tame or animals that maybe produce a lot of milk or whatever. Um, so, so we're promoting certain genetics and, 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 and over time they mutate, they become other you know, traits. There's a lot of unintended consequences to domestication. Because a lot of times you're selecting you know, for one trait, which basically is one gene, but that gene might have other, uh, you know, other things that, that it's affecting. And for instance, floppy ears, uh, domesticated animals do tend to have very floppy ears. And this actually is because in their brain, uh, as they're becoming domesticated, their brains are literally changing, uh, becoming smaller, but yet more complex. Uh, parts of the brain that controls the uh, production of cartilage actually changes to the point that they produce less cartilage, hence floppy ears. Plus, they seem, animals seem friendlier with floppy ears. And so we also seem to be, those are the ones that we wanna keep. So we're also promoting these kinds of traits. Um, and this is all the, known as the domesticated uh, syndrome. Um, everything I talked about with pigs, we've seen uh, many times in other domesticated animals. Darwin first described this in 1859. He was fascinated by the floppy ear thing because he began to notice that the wild versions had very straight ears and then the, the domesticated ones floppy. He couldn't figure out why that was important. Why, why would nature do that? But of course, it seems to be an unintended byproduct of domestication. Uh, it's not necessarily, there's no purpose to it um, necessarily, but, but we humans kind of like it. So, so it probably does help them, you know, be kept around. Uh, I like this article because it, it, it's talking about dogs in two ways, not only um, talking about the floppy ears and the fact that we do tend to like them, uh, but also the use of dogs and things like airports and such. So the floppy ears might be a little bit, makes them look a little cuter and cuteness is hugely important in human nature. You know, um, we like babies uh, and we, that's natural. You know, humans immediately, even, even people claim they don't like babies. They, they get around the baby and you, you talk softer, you might talk a little higher pitch, you open your eyes wide, you look at them, you, 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 you try to seem unthreatening, you want to hold it, you know, you almost can't help yourself. Um, that's nature because obviously we have to take care of babies to survive as a species. So we're, we're basically adapted to wanting to be around babies. And unless you're a psychopath, you see a baby, it's hard not to go, oh, right? Um, so again, it, it is an aspect of domestication syndrome to some degree. Um, because we have self-domesticated. Um, so it is natural to like our babies, but, but also um, we, we have kind of bred ourselves um, to, to have some of these qualities, you know, and, uh, and cuteness seems to be one of them. We like cute things and that leads to more domestication of other animals. So Conrad Lorenz, some of you may know him because he was the first one to, to, to discover imprinting. For instance, when duck, chicks are born, the first thing they see, they will assume it's their mother. And uh, that's called imprinting. Conrad Lorenz was a scientist that discovered that. Uh, but he also talked about this cuteness thing. And he's, he, he coined the term baby releasers. So that, that, that part of it, even now, you, hopefully some of you are looking at this puppy going, oh, look at that puppy. That's your baby releaser coming up, that parental 
urge, that instinct that we have to take care of babies, which we know a baby as something that looks cute. And so that uh, big head, big big eyes, small small body, small little squat, chubby little arms. Uh, we just recognize that as cute, um, but really what we're doing is we're recognizing that as a baby. And even though logically we know it's like this thing isn't a baby, but that cuteness kind of in our in our deep natural brain still has the same response. So again, you notice a lot of domesticated animals kind of have a lot of them have kind of a cuteness and that seems to be the cuter they are, the more we're likely to take care of them. Um, so if you look at a baby, you know, the proportions of its head and body, you know, if, if you made a baby six foot tall with those same proportions, it, again, it would be a freak. Uh, you know, um, so the, the shape of a baby is what we uh, just think, oh, that's, that's what is cute. Um, and so if you look at uh, other animals that we consider to be cute, it has a lot of these probably big head, big eyes, eyes close together, small mouth, small little squat body. We consider that to be truly cute. And we see it all the time in pop culture. Like I think I have some of these, I know you can't really see it, but I have some of these vinyl pop figures via, over my shoulder here. Uh, and again, you know, they're big heads, big eyes, uh, small little bodies. We recognize that as cute. Oh, the Japanese have a word for this. I'm sure some of you know this already, kawaii, which is the idea of, of kind of cuteness. And in fact, uh, the, the vinyl pop figures are basically uh, sort of the American version of kawaii uh, things that, that are very popular in Japan, which also very popular in Japan is Disney cartoons, which kind of created. In fact, if you look at the history of kawaii culture, it is an adaptation from Disney cartoons because Japan absolutely loves Disney cartoons. And Bambi is kind of the ultimate of, of early Disney films that, that really bathed in cuteness, right? Uh, the story of a deer. We're gonna be watching it as part of our class later this semester. But it's interesting if you look at some of the original drawings of Bambi and the other animals, they were a little more realistic looking originally. And it was only over time that they said, let's make the eyes bigger, let's make the head bigger, um, let, let's make them more cute. And of course, so much of the movie takes place when they're young anyway. Uh, but what's interesting, like this drawing is, is from a later uh, iteration of Bambi. And again, the cuteness has really been jacked up even more. Um, you can do this even with Mickey Mouse. You look at early Mickey Mouse from the 20s, early 30s, he's much more rodent looking. And then over time, he evolved into a more cute looking figure. And again, the, the animators probably weren't necessarily going, let's make them cute. It was just a draw and people go, oh, I kind of like that one better than that one. Okay, let's keep drawing them this way. And over time, because of the responses of the audience, uh, he becomes cuter um, and, 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 and you know, more softer, more baby-like in many ways and less rodent-like. What's really happening to Mickey Mouse and Bambi uh, is what we call neoteny. Basically, neoteny is, is the retention of juvenile or baby features into maturity. This is a baby chump. Looks a lot like human. <laughs> it even walks on two legs. It has much more of a flat human face. Uh, and yet, when, when you know, if you look at the human baby skull uh, in, a, in, a, in a chimpanzee skull, they're not that different. But then when you look at the adult skulls, they're incredibly different. As you can see, the chimpanzee skull becomes much more ape-like, bigger brow ridge, longer snout little harsher features, um, while a human skull does that a little bit, but we don't do, the teeth thing doesn't happen in the way it does with chimps. We don't get the big fangs anymore. We don't quite get the big snout coming out. We don't really have, in fact, our head is a much bigger head. It's still kind of more like a baby's head. And in other words, humans in many ways are kind of the neotenized ape. In fact, we think that's exactly what it is. Um, but, but again, you can look at it, this is a very stylized, but you can see how other animals have that baby quality, that cute quality, and then, but when they turn into adults, they lose it. We maintain it more than many others. And interesting, this domestication uh, process is actually a, um, something that can be done fairly quickly. It doesn't necessarily take thousands of years. The silver fox, which is native in Russia, uh, and foxes can be dangerous. Uh, uh, back in the 40s and 50s, scientists started uh, capturing these foxes, and then they would uh, find the, the most tame ones, take those, breed them, and then let that generation grow, and then take the most tame one of those for the third generation. And they, they've done this for eight generations, and they have already gone from truly wild foxes to pets that you can keep literally as dogs, very gentle, loving, expressive pets. Um, 
you know, and again, we're, we're talking 50, 60 years. We're not talking 10,000 years. So we can actually do this fairly quickly. And again, we seem to have done it to ourselves. We, Homo sapien is the domesticated ape, if you will. Um, we have a lot of the qualities of domesticated animals. Um, we lost our fur, we have large heads, we have shorter limbs, we do have smaller brains, like say compared to Neanderthals, more complex and intelligent brains, but still nonetheless uh, more. And by the way, basically what starts happening is part of our brain that's more about culture and, and socialization expands and the other part of our brain that's more about fighting and that, that kind of wildness begins to dissipate if you will that's at the end here i know i'm getting close on time here uh let's talk a little bit about pets and you know so what is a pet uh it seems funny but it's kind of hard to define one what makes a pet different from say livestock historian keith thomas who we'll be talking about later back in the 70s said basically it's animals allowed in the house that we name that we never eat the problem with that is sometimes we do that with livestock as well uh, and not all pets live in the house. So it, it's been toyed with. And, and, and the answer zoologist, James Serpell, said it's animals that we live with, not necessarily in the house, but it's that we live with, that have no obvious function. And really, I need to add, other than emotional function. Because in many ways, animals, you know, we make fun of, you know, people joke about, oh, emotional support animals, what a silly idea. Isn't that what all pets are? We all do this, right? Um, but but we're not using pets for meat. We're not using pets. In fact, would you eat your pet? I mean, if your dog died, would you eat it? I mean, it's dead, right? No, most of us would be like, that's gross, that's horrible. Um, so, so again, they don't have the obvious livestock function. Why do we do this? Uh, it's kind of another thing. Why, why do humans even do this thing? We spend billions of dollars every year on this. It, it, there does seem to be some function to it. And in fact, with dogs, it might be, we, do, we might use them a little bit for hunting and stuff, although nowhere near as much as the amount of dogs that we have. That is, that's only a, a small explanation. Uh, but the main reason we seem to keep animals around, even if they maybe were more livestock at one time, uh, it does seem to be emotional. We, we, we want a connection to them, uh, but it's not universal necessarily. It doesn't seem to be evolved because not all cultures keep pets. Lots of Africa don't, don't have pets. Uh, dogs are eaten all over the world. Um, so it doesn't seem to necessarily be evolutionary. However, E.O. Wilson, Edward Osborne Wilson, a biologist, still around, teaches at Harvard, from Alabama originally, uh, studies ants, and he's very interested in sort of looking at nature to understand humans. And again, he grew up in Alabama, did a lot of studies in Georgia and Florida on fire ants, but he's always been interested in the connection between nature and the, the natural, uh, and humans. And in the 1980s, he came up with a, a concept he called biophilia, uh, which basically means the love of life. And he says, you know, humans have this. We, we want to be in nature. We want to go to the parks. We want to go camping. And he would argue this is why a lot of humans keep pets. We, we seem to need, e even keeping plants, house plants and stuff, we seem to need to be near nature. And as we become more second nature, we want to put first nature, or at least the appearance of first nature in our lives. There's always been a lot of debate about pets when I was younger. I mean, I, we have two dogs and two cats. And I was, when I was younger, I always felt guilty having pets. Um, and some people say, you know, you, basically you're trapping these animals. And some people have even used the word slavery for pets. But what's interesting is that in many cases, the pets have actually chosen to be around us. We didn't necessarily force them to do it. They chose to do it themselves. Um, even all of our animals are rescue animals. And at least two of them came to us. We didn't go to them. Um, so how did that happen? You know, again, looking at domestication and, and, you know, if you looked at early dogs or what now are house cats, probably originally they were closer to what raccoons are, animals that are kind of stalking around the edges of society, eating what they can, invading garbage and stuff. And then they, at some point they either just domesticated themselves or we brought them in and domesticated them. So raccoons today uh, may very well be what cats and dogs were 5,000 years ago. Um, and this idea of animals living off humans, commensalism is basically what we're talking about, exploiting for their purposes our activities. And you can think of a lot of animals that do this. And again, this is probably how domestication sort of began. Rats, mice, pigeons, raccoons, house sparrows, squirrels, um, seagulls, I mean, you know, animals that always show up when we're doing certain things. In fact, in many cases, kind of survive on us now. They really depend on us for this. And um, 
So cats are an example that probably started out that way that then we took in. Cats are really interesting because they are quite different from say dogs in the way they behave. Um, and yet we humans are very contradictory when it comes to animals. Like I said, cats and dogs are eaten in other parts of the world yet we keep, tend to keep them as pets. And so we think of them as like, there's something wrong with those people. But yet, while we may shut down the New York City subway system for a couple hours just for two little kittens, at the same time, literally millions of cats are killed every year of, because they're feral, because there's too many of them. So it's very odd that, it, but yet we won't eat them. You know, we, we'll kill them, but we won't eat them. It, it's, again, it doesn't always completely make logical sense. Um, and with cats in particular, um, there is a sense of who tamed who, because um, in a way they do seem to have adopted us as their pets. And really it's interesting that we always say, well, you know, we, we, we say sit to a dog, go fetch dog or go help me hunt. Cats don't do any of that. In fact, we're the ones that do tricks to them. They, they meow and suddenly we give them food. They, they, they rub against their leg and we enter their cat litter box. We seem to be the one doing the trick, not them doing us. And it's interesting, they don't really do anything for us other than maybe an emotional connection, but yet we spend lots of money, billions every year to take care of them, take them to the vet, buy cat litter, all this fun stuff. And so basically cats are maybe the most successful at hijacking that baby releaser to make us want to take care of them. So house cats today, all over the world, uh, they all come from one source. They come from the uh, basically to the Middle East, pretty much again around Turkey. Uh, Felis sylvestra um, is, is the species from which all house cats come from. There's five different varieties of this species. Only one variety, uh, Libica uh, from the Middle East, is the one that became house cats. In fact, the other four varieties are really almost undomesticatable, if you will. Uh, but again, like with almost all other animals, about 11,000 years ago, about 9,000 year, years ago, we begin to see domestication in places like Turkey, eventually moving into Egypt and other places. But they do seem more than not to be self-taming. Um, and this is the site in Turkey that you see, we see the first bones of domesticated cats anywhere in the world. And again, a lot of, if you own cats, you know this already, uh, they do a lot of behavior that makes no sense. They do a lot of meowing, they purr a lot, they need, they get on your belly and they need your belly. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any real purpose to any of this. It's kind of a package deal as they're tamed, as they're domesticating, these just seem to be qualities that are kind of, that come with that. Uh, and really what they are, are juvenile qualities. It's neotenin, neotenization again. Uh, they purr, they need, they meow when they're babies. In fact, most animals as babies, including human babies, make lots of noises. And then as they get older, they quit making the noises because they're gonna get predators. So, you know, human you know, dogs bark, but wolves don't hardly make any noise at all. Same with wild cats make very little noise. Human cats meow all the time because they know they get food that way. Um, so it's again, it's neotenization. And you can even see the, the look between a wild cat, which looks very much like a house cat, but at the same time, our, you know, house cats are literally cuter. They're slightly more even human looking. Um, what's really interesting about cats though, is that even though they have some of these qualities, they are less domesticated than animals like dogs. And in fact, if you look at cats in the wild, whether it's lions or tigers or panthers uh, or, you know, even other varieties of Sylvestra, um, they all have the same form. Even the house cats, they have the same teeth, they have the same body. Uh, so even though there are, you know, a little bit of floppy ears, not much, um, even their tails are still pretty firm. They're not real floppy tails. Um, even though they may purr and, and do some of these other things, at the same time, they have maintained a lot more of their wild features. And maybe it's because they're a little less dogs go back further, but it is still interesting that they are really are more wild. Um, and there is a fear of cats. There's a hatred of cats a lot of people have, and it's kind of odd, like, why is that? And some theories are, I mean, they are nocturnal. They're very solitary. In fact, it's weird that we keep them because they're not really social animals. Uh, they're very stealthy. Uh, by the way, the only social one is really the lion. The lion does have a pack, a hide, uh, what I'm saying, a pride. Um, and house cats kind of have a little bit of that, but for the most part, uh, they're solitary, they're very stealthy, they're always hunting, they're always looking, you, they look like something's going on, but you're not sure what. Um, they're less expressionistic, it's harder to read a cat in the way you can a dog. Um, I think there's a blankness that, that 
kind of seems odd to people. The reproduction, basically I'm talking about literally the sounds they make. It does sound like a baby screaming or a woman screaming. You can understand why people might think they were possessed at one time. But the, the biggest theory, James Rappel came up with this and I think he might be right. Cat allergies are a real thing and they can be really bad for people. So a cat shows up, suddenly you're sick, you're sneezing, you can't breathe. It, it is almost like they bewitched you, they, 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 they did something to you. So cat allergies very well may be the root of a lot of these fears uh, about cats. Our relationship with cats completely changed after 1947 when a guy named Edward Lowe invented kitty litter. And it seems like a silly little thing, but basically it brought cats indoors permanently. Now, like our cats never leave the outdoor. And we also spent a lot of money on cat litter to, uh, again, we're doing the tricks for them. Uh, there's about 600 million cats in the U.S. today. There's as many cats in Australia as there are people in Australia. Uh, there's more cats born every day in New York City than there are lions or tigers in the world. Um, you know, but yet they are a major invasive species. Um, they do completely alter their environment. Like for instance, the Key Largo wood mouse is almost completely uh, eradicated uh, because. Um, Cats, you know, cats that, that are kept have, have, have hunted it to extinction. And yet, you know, we, we worry about overpopulation of cats. So we trap, we neuter, we return, but, but we do promote cats you know, being feral. And yet they have a huge problem with, as an invasive exotic. So while we get rid of some exotics, we maintain and even promote the keeping of cats. Finally, dogs, uh, the oldest domesticated animal going back 30,000 years or more, there is a unique relationship between us and dogs. All dogs, no matter whether they're poodles or Great Danes, come from the gray wolf. Uh, we know that through DNA today, uh, but it is very unique. Um, it is almost unlike any other um, relationship. They can read us. They literally know what we're thinking a lot of times. You know, one thing that you can do, like, like say have a dog, and if you go just point, the dog will look. And sometimes even no, you mean, oh, go over there, which is slightly an abstract thing that a pointing finger means go over there. You can't do that to a cat. Or you can, like, if, if you just point at something, it'll just go to it. Cats won't do that. Other animals won't do that. Uh, in fact, in some ways, the social cognition, the, their, their brains, the way they pick up on social cues is even more advanced than apes. And again, this is probably because we've lived together for so long. We can read dogs, they can read us. Um, and again, all of, all dogs today, they're not wolves, they're dogs, they're, they're second nature. We created these dogs. And all these breeds, however, are all the same species. Um, so we sometimes do have to keep that in mind. So even though we have all these surface level uh, changes, they are still all one species. So the phenotype, the, the form, the shape, the size, uh, that's all kind of surface. Uh, while, you know, so again, they're all the same. In the same way humans, you know, we're all human, but we may look different, different body shapes, different hairs, different sound. But again, it's just our phenotypes. It is not the genes. We're not separate species and dogs are not separate species. And dog changes happen mostly. In fact, a lot of this is within the last hundred years. And a lot of racial differences between people also is probably just a few thousand years old, not 40 or 50,000 years old, for instance. And again, dogs are, you know, they're in a weird position because they've been around a long time, but yet, you know, the difference between livestock and a pet, between food and a pet is uh, not fixed. Some areas in the world, um, dogs are eaten. These taboos against rules against what we can and can't do, they do change over time. We used to eat sea turtles, we used to eat manatees. Now we wouldn't dream of doing that. Uh, taco de lingua, basically a uh, taco made of cow's tongue. Some people would eat that. It's actually not bad. Uh, other people think that's completely gross. So culture to culture has different uh, taboos and what they are willing to eat and what they're not. I can't watch. I can't look at this one. <laughs> what they're willing to eat and what they're not willing to eat. And again, us, we don't do dogs, but other parts of the world really do do dogs. Um, so even with pets, you can see it's still cultural. Some, you know, what we consider to be a pet is not what other people necessarily consider to be a pet. But it is a symbiotic relationship. Dogs cannot exist without humans. Cats can, dogs cannot. They have to have humans taking care of them. Um, you will see a starving dog, you know, if it's too, if it's out in the wild, but you won't necessarily see a starving cat. All right, enough of pets. I know it took way longer than I wanted to, but nonetheless, that there's about pets and domestication. We will come back to pets later, but when we're talking about exotics and the problems, and that will be a modern story, a story of the 70s and 80s. 
Okay, well, thank you guys. And I will see you later.